Okay, welcome everybody to our next iteration of our podcast, Coffee with Cow. I'm Chris Lawler, the CEO and co-founder of Learn International. We're a boutique provider based in Ireland, offering programming across Europe, uh, Southeast and Eastern Asia, and Australia and New Zealand. And today, um, we are very thankful to be able to be spending some time and chatting with Liz Dilley, who is the Assistant Director for Student Life and International Programs at the University of South Carolina Aiken. Thanks very much for being with us, Liz. How are you today? I am good. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all. It's an absolute pleasure. And um, it's been a while since we've seen each other. I think we, we keep kind of semi bumping into each other and, and what have you. But, um, but it's great to be able to kind of chat through, you know, the wonders of modern technology. Um, and uh, so tell us, uh, how are things in Aiken at the moment? What's, uh, what's happening? Um, things are good. I think it's like many kind of smaller rural places in um, in the United States where I don't know that COVID-19 is felt as keenly because we just don't have as many cases. Um, and I think so. So we probably have some who are, you know, not really understanding why this is important to social distance and those sorts of things. But overall, I mean, it's been, you know, pretty calm. There hasn't really been any really intense moments or anything like that when I've gone out to the grocery store. Um, so it's been kind of interesting being an observer too. Mm, yeah, I, 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 I get it. I want to come, come back to that, but I kind of leapfrogged a few things. First, let's, let's just uh, talk about yourself and how did you, you're not from South Carolina originally, are you? No, I'm originally from Pennsylvania. I have lived in the South or in the Southeast region for about 10 years. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, so originally I'm from South Central Pennsylvania in a little small town um, of Tippensburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay. And uh, how, what, tell us how you uh, got into study abroad, because when I've been talking to a couple of other people on our podcast, the, the, generally speaking, I think it's not something that, you know, when you're 10 or 15 or something, you're like, I want to be a study abroad director. That's what I want to do. Usually it's, you know, you've been shaped along the way in terms of your experiences. So what's your story? I actually went to a private um, university for my undergrad in Ohio, and it actually, like, it had international experiences, but it didn't actually have a study abroad office or international student office, nothing like that. And so it wasn't until, and I sought out some of those global experiences during that time and during a gap year that I had taken before my undergrad, um, but it wasn't until I was a graduate assistant at, um, Shippensburg University for my master's program in the international programs office that I was like, this is a legit job. Like this is something that like I could do. And at the time, um, so my, um, at the time, my major was applied history. So museum work, those sorts of things. And at the time I knew that it'd be very difficult to, to get into the history field because of, I just knew that there was other people who had been searching for so long and my boss, my graduate assistantship really encouraged me um, to seek out opportunities within <laughs> education. Um, and so she started sending me like Sakusa posts and job descriptions and, and really was a mentor um, for helping me to kind of like break into the field. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how I started was uh, as a graduate assistant and just really seeking out um, opportunities following grad school. And how did you find, you know, um, her mentorship? Um, do you think that that shaped, uh, you know, your attitude towards study abroad now? Or have you, you know, have you matured into your role in terms of, uh, do, you, do you think that your approach to study abroad is similar to what hers was? Or has it moved on? Or has it, has it, has it changed over the years? Um, I think it's changed and developed definitely. Um, she, as a you know, as a supervisor, as a mentor, you know, as a as her graduate assistant, I did have a lot of autonomy. She was really great at allowing me to um, kind of create and change and shape and even really get into the nitty nitty gritty of you know, rather than just being <clears throat> doing like newsletters or filing or anything like that. She really let me like advise students on study abroad and. Um, and wasn't, and you know, I could do like a study abroad 101 session and really carry, um, carry that through and, and show some of that um, passion that I have for the field. So that really, really helped in just kind of moving into the next that it was, it was 
a graduate assistantship, but it was very intentional and very engaging to help build that foundation for the field. Um, and so when I moved into my next role, um, I would say that even those like supervisors that I had then were really acting as mentors for me as well, because I was new to the field. And so I learned a lot having to, um, you know, having to maybe deal directly with international students or some of their immigration issues. Like before that, as a graduate assistant, I couldn't do a lot of the immigration stuff. And so, um, <clears throat> so it's definitely changed in shape over the years. I think um, anyone who I've seen as kind of like a mentor, as a supervisor, even colleagues have really kind of shaped and changed how I operate as a, as a, a professional in international education. And I think some of that foundation started as a, as a graduate assistant, um, but I think it's definitely, definitely changed. Yeah. I think it's just because I have so much more knowledge, I think, now than I did then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some of the naivety is gone. Maybe. It's funny. It's uh, I, I, you know, it's hard to compare when you, you know, you spend your time in one particular sector. It's, it, it's easy to say, well, I think more than other sectors. But how can we say that unless we've actually been in multiple sectors? But, mm -hmm. you know, I was about to say, I think, you know, um, there is. It's a burgeoning sector. Relatively, it's a relatively young sector, um, uh, even though it's decades and decades old or more. Uh, it's still relatively young compared to other professions and. Um, so there's a little bit of catch up in terms of theory and, and, and best practice and that type of, of, of stuff. And so a lot of it is really, you can't, um, uh, there's no um, alternative to actually experiencing something. And, you know, not that necessarily it's the entirety, but a, a, a sense of intercultural understanding and common sense is really important um, when, when delivering programs, I think. And uh, so, uh, really you have to dive in and 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 go for it there and the mentorship is so important i think uh, and because you don't have those uh, reference points um when you have less experience at the start so yeah that's interesting first year as an international ed professional like full-time um and i was still an intern at that time um but even so like uh, the office i was working for really treated me as a full-time staff member, you know, even as, even though my title was intern. And so I was working for them full-time and it was like 2010, 2011. And that was a rough academic year. I mean, not as bad as 2020, but like, it was like, it was like the revolution in Egypt. It was, uh, you know, earthquakes in Japan. And we also had to deal with the death of a couple of our international students. So it was a wild like trial by fire that first mm -hmm. year. And so it, it taught me so much about myself, but also about like, just, yeah, just so much about just like the field and things that you have to consider. Cause I'm actually one of those professionals that has never been on kind of one side of international education or the other. Like I've always been in that broad kind of international education or international program. So I've done study abroad and international students and, and some people are just like, well, maybe you should like choose a specific direction and I can't really see myself doing that because I really just love working with both of those populations um so much but it's just like yeah I can't really I can't really envision giving up one side <laughs> or the other even though there are definitely days where it's like oh I wish I only had to do education abroad or only had to do international student services but um but yeah it's, it's been very interesting yeah, I guess, you know, uh, for you, then it's important maybe to have, you know, the office that your environment that you're in is, is a, maybe a smaller office can actually have dual roles. It's, it's achievable, you know, if you're in the Ohio State or something like that, it's just not, not a possible thing to do both. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And does that, does that shape the roles that you look for um, in that you're looking for this additional responsibility you want to have fingers in, in different sectors and pies? Yeah. yeah. So I have been in the field now for about 12-ish plus years. Um, and, and based on kind of some of my past experiences, I've really just found that I seek out opportunities that allow me to build and create something. Um, so I usually, when I'm really, really drawn to positions that, um, that someone is looking for 
you know, initiative or, or people to come in and build and change. Um, and so I am a one person office. So any kind of anything that I want to do like long term or build policies and procedures, those sorts of things like I have to bal it's a lot of different like balancing that time management and because some of those things like building an immigration policy and procedures manual or a study abroad crisis manual um, or is a lot of work for one person and so you're you're having to really take a lot of that burden and so it's like how do you also do those day-to-day -day things like promoting study abroad and moving those goals forward while also having that foundation in place. So yeah, I do tend to seek out opportunities at smaller institutions. I tend to, um, uh, to me, private, I've worked for both private and I'm currently at a state school. So um, those are very, two very different environments. So it was a very interesting learning experience going from private universities to a, to a state university. Um, there was a lot, I thought, I'm, I thought of myself as an extremely patient person. <laughs> And I generally am, but uh, moving to a state school environment where there's a lot more red tape, that was fascinating. And I'm still still learning to kind of just like provide some of that patience and set those expectations for both myself and, and partners or anything that I work with that like, okay, if we're signing a contract or if we're doing an invoice, it might take two weeks, it might take six months, who knows, like it just, it's been very fascinating. So yeah, it's, it, but in baseline, I tend to look for programs that are um, that are going to allow me to build and create and to really make be an agent of change and to really um, make an impact. And I find that I do best in smaller kind of university settings where I can build those relationships and build that community and that network. Mm. Yeah, that I mean, so much to talk about there. Um, uh, I want to have a, a, a just a brief chat about um, the differences you feel, the different stresses you feel um, as a one-person office as opposed to to a, to a larger office. Um, you know, can you talk us through the, those those typical things that you're coming up against, and some of the some of the ways that you have innovated to to try and be more efficient to you know improve output and and really kind of move all your goals forward while you are the you know multi-level doing grassroots stuff and trying to you know look at strategic multi-year plans and those types of things well when i start at a new institution um one of my first goals during that time is to build that community and build that um uh, those resources across different campus networks because I think international education like on any campus is going to be that bridge between um, faculty and staff and it's like I, I've never been at a university at this point that hasn't that where the international office isn't kind of that uh, that bridge to all other places on campus you know like they at most U.S. universities it's like okay, the international programs office is not just working with staff, it's not just working with faculty, they're not really, like, they have to really jump into those silos and to be able to be effective advocates for their students um, and for their office. And so that's usually my first is to, okay, find those resources, find those people I need to connect with. If I'm not doing international admissions, who is? Um, and connecting with that person to build a really good relationship and, and open communication. I tend to also be um, someone who likes to, brutal honesty is not really what I want to, to say, but almost like uh, transparency. So I've also just found that like sometimes um, faculty or staff might make decisions about my international students because they just don't know what, um, what some of the immigration policies need to be considered or they're just looking at them as a regular student and not considering these other identities or or needs that they might have so like i've created just like baseline immigration guides of like here are things that you need to know so but as a one person office in general i mean once you kind of have that foundation and you're having to deal with a lot of those day to days i would say it's for me, it, it means that like I have to be willing to delegate and let things go a lot. <laughs> like I have to, I mean, I'm there first and foremost to be an advocate for our students. 
Um, but, you know, I have the only other individuals that I, so I'm like the one professional staff member, but I have student staff who can probably take some of these study abroad promotional development or, um, or doing some of our marketing across campus or connecting and building programming for international students. Like they can do some of that. It might mean early training with them and helping them build those professional skills, but I have to put a lot of trust in them and a, and a lot of just kind of delegation in order to focus on some of those procedural and operational things so that the office can, can operate smoothly as well as we're not caught off guard from um, and that yeah so that we're not caught off guard by something maybe major or even that maybe not everything on how to do stuff is in my head so I've created um, uh, various kind of different procedures like an operations management um, shared folder or drive that like if a student comes in and, and they need um, just a letter for the DMV, like an international student needs a letter for the DMV. There's a standard letter, someone can pull it up, you know, modify it and just like print it and change it. So it's a lot of those things that like just help really like once you kind of get over that, um, you know, first year, just kind of digging into it. Once you kind of like get past that and have some of those foundations in place, it makes it a little bit easier to focus more on the day to day and and move those goals forward but sometimes it might even just mean putting a day on your calendar where like you are not disturbed by anything but that and, and sometimes it works sometimes it fails but sometimes you just do what you got to do yeah i think so one of the things that i'm finding now about uh, you know this uh, imposed restriction um and remote working environment is um you know, an increased output because of lack of um, uh, distraction, I suppose. And, it, you know, it's easier to manage potential distractions in terms of instant message pings and those types of things. You can just turn it off and that's, and that's it. And then you can just focus on things. Um, and I, I found that, you know, structuring my day has helped an awful lot. Um, I have more of a structure now than I, I can remember in many, many years. Um, so that is a silver lining of it. But, but it, you talked a little bit about the difference between a state institution and a private institution. Can you kind of unpack that a bit for us and, and what's been your experience with both of them? Sure. Um, so private institutions tend to just, because they're not really subject to a lot of the same state regulations or, or laws maybe surrounding how money is spent. And, um, you know, for funding, because like state institutions receive funding from the state government, um, they have to really be transparent on how that money is being spent. Whereas private institutions, um, they have a little bit more leeway on like their financial policies and, and they seem to just, they can operate maybe a little bit faster, I guess you could say, um, because a lot of times they tend to be smaller. Um, so they're not having to kind of go through these multiple different offices or red tape or um, uh, and that you can probably go directly to the provost or directly to um, uh, directly to like the president of the university and, and have that conversation and cut through. Now, like a small state institution like USC Aiken um, does tend to operate in a similar fashion to a small private college in that, um, you know, I can go and talk to our chancellor at any time and, and you know, it's, uh, I don't have to necessarily go through four other people before I, before I do that. Um, but I think it's, it's more on the policy and procedure side. So for example, because we're part of like the, the USC um, state system, um, if I want to get a new, partnership with a with the organization um, or, a pro, or a provider or something like that or if I want to say purchase a, a study abroad software if I wanted to purchase a study abroad software if it hasn't been used by anyone in the state system before then it has to go through like a committee of this of the USC system that only apparently meets once a year <laughs> or you know it's like it, it's one of those things that that has to be then vetted by 
this committee and then it goes down through like our contract process and then we have a whole vendor process that has to go into the system before they can get paid and so a lot of times that process can just depending on where you're starting in it if this if this organization has never worked with the state system before um it can take like six months to a year to get some of that through and process so for me it was more about setting my own expectations, but also when I work with um, new partners or new vendors or um, anything on that line, I really have to set up expectations and just say like, this might happen in four weeks, this might happen in six months, like, um, you know, just to just to kind of be upfront with some of that, those issues. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I would say a lot of it is just on the procedural side of like what you're having to consider and and whereas whereas I think there's just a lot more flexibility at a private school level on, you know, if you want to throw an idea out there that maybe has never been done before, you feel like you haven't been able to find it anywhere. A private school might be more willing to possibly jump on that and create something new. Whereas I think there's just further steps in individual to consider at a state at a state institution level. Yeah. Yeah. So, but most of it is on like the procedural side where it's like you're just having to have a lot more time. So like when I'm doing study abroad proposals with faculty members, like I'm starting that a year and a half in advance with them because, you know, it's it's one of those things that they decide they want to work with the new um, provider, then we have to get that provider in the system and we don't want to wait until two weeks before an invoice is due to do that because yeah. it will take maybe six to eight weeks to get them in the system if they're not there. So it's a, it's a lot of just kind of reconsidering procedures and reconsidering, you know, contracts and how we do a lot, how I do a lot of those, um, those things just to, to make sure it's a smooth process for faculty as well as my own sanity honestly. yeah 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 i mean we've been on that at, at the other end of that where you know you, you the first time that you're onboarded as a provider for for a state institution and yeah. uh, not always state but mostly state institutions and uh, you know we're coming to it with an expectation of you know uh, slightly slower than a private that we might be working with and then suddenly it's like six months and seven months and you're going okay now this is becoming a problem <laughs> you know yeah. um but typically things i think once um once you start to work a little bit more things do tend to speed up because everybody gets to know the system and knows your name is then known and you know it just it just it goes that way but uh but yeah. I can figure that out. it's definitely just a transition and it's something mm. to keep in mind and and that you know if I myself transitioned from like a private institution into state institutions. So it taught me a lot, but I think that is always, it's an interesting part of the field I didn't consider because I have mm. had that where I've been at private, like if I'm at a private institution and I'm applying for a job at a state institution, that has been a question asked of me um, about like how I will do with that transition or especially it's even I've gotten questions okay like you're currently at a small and when I usually say small I mean under 5,000 maybe even under 3,000 students and they're just like okay how how would you handle moving from you know a campus of, of 1,200 students to a campus of 30,000 um, and it's a very interesting question I think to be asked during an inter interview process um, because I think yeah, I think it sometimes depends on personality, but that's always been a very interesting question that I've gotten that it's like, it's either a question about like, oh, how do you feel about moving or how can you, how do you think you'll handle moving from a private to a public or a, you know, a small school to a large university. And so that's always been very interesting. Yeah. And so let's say there are people out there now that are about to, you know, head into interviews, you know, if there are any going on at the moment, we could talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but, uh, you know, how did you answer that or how would you answer that now with the knowledge that you have? I mean, I think some of it is even relating it to um, experiences that you have had. So if you, so for example, for me, even though I, I've, you know, my undergraduate was a small private college, my graduate program was like a middle sized state institution. And then I've worked at smaller middling private universities and now I'm at a state school. 
So when I was answering that question, I would, I would respond to it a little bit more about, okay, my experience doing an internship in London, right? Like, yes, I was, um, you know, I was working at a, an archive, like the Westminster City Archives in London, but I was living in this massive um, country that was outside of my comfort zone coming from rural Pennsylvania, you know? So it's like, you can talk about some of those experiences where you've had to adjust to very different environments and how you handled that. Um, so I've, I've answered it that way. I've also answered it as um, from almost kind of like an organizational or time management perspective that, um, you know, or even a positive, like how can, you know, how has maybe a smaller private or a smaller institution really prepared you for working at a larger institution? It could be talking about like, you know, the networking that you've been able to build at, you know, that you've had, you've developed those types of skills. You've also been able to really maybe dig into some of the minutia of international education, or you've been able to really, because most of us at smaller institutions, we're having to do everything in international programs. Like we're having to juggle study abroad, international um, student services, and we're having to also like lead that the university in that. Like we're the one person on campus who's the expert in those things. And I would say that when you're being the person that everyone comes to with these questions, I mean, that can relate back to an experience for like a, a moving to a large state institution that you're used to juggling a lot of different um, needs and, and people's expectations and setting goals and having to do more with less. And so I think that can always be seen as like a positive in, in those situations. So That's yeah, so I would say like relating it back to an experience and also how can you find like it's not a detriment coming from a smaller or a private institution. It's a, you know, it's a positive and it can be um, it can really help in just kind of shaping and changing how you approach a large state state institution. I mean, mm. um, yeah, that you've been able to just kind of really dig into mm. this education. Yeah. So. You know, that makes perfect sense. It does. And I think, you know, uh, people will take from that. And I think uh, uh, there will be people that will be interested to hear your thoughts. On yeah, that I mean, even I think it's probably dump those silos and being able, you know, I mean, I have no, I, some of this has just been working with um, at smaller institutions is that I have no problem just kind of walking into a faculty member's office or to a, to a staff member's office when I've never met them before and just introducing myself. And, and I would say at one point in my life, I was much more introverted and I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a huge fan, but I have to like push myself to do that in order to be an effective advocate for my students. And so, um, and I say, I would say that like a lot of times in larger massive institutions, it can be very easy to get really siloed because, um, and get into your own kind of like bubble and just focus on on your own own needs. And I think that international offices at those campuses are great in in being able to to build that community and that network and connect people across across the board. Mm. Yeah, I, I'd like to I'd like to shift gear a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, if you're not comfortable chatting about this, that's perfectly fine. But you mentioned earlier on about you know the death of two of your international students. You know, it's a it's a very poignant thing, and it's and it's a you know par families and parents sent them off to this amazing experience, and then they never, they never came home, and you know it's um it's that real. I want elephant in the room is the wrong term, but it's that real possibility that we all as international educators live with all of the time, because every moment anybody exists anywhere, a bus can sweep them off, or things can happen that is through no fault of anybody. Um, but I think there's, you know, this balance of uh, mitigation and risk from the institution's perspective um, that goes into how and what we can build as programs and who can go and how we prepare them and those types of things. But, but what can you tell us and what are you prepared to, to kind of tell us in terms of, of, of that situation with those two students? Um, I mean, it's still something that, I mean, that happened in 2010. And so 10 years later, or almost 10 years later, because it was fall of 2010, it's something that I'm still processing for myself personally. Um, and I've, I do actually, cause like it can be for myself somewhat of a trigger because like normally, 
when it comes to, because I've, I've had to act as like, um, for the entire university, I've been on like the on-call rotation, like I've been in emergency situations quite a bit, but um, I, but I, I'm a little bit more open with those who might be the kind of first call or first point of contact and just um, letting them know for my own personal, like if you call me and you say to me, because these students passed away in a car accident um, specifically. And, if, and so, for example, I was working at the same institution um, and uh, it was whew, six, seven years later and someone who didn't know this history about the institution, but specifically about my experience, called me and was like, hey, your student was um, in, a, in a car accident. Um, they're taking her to the hospital. And like, I just, it like just triggered me so hard. Like I was like, just because normally I'm like really even keel. Like in most emergency situations, I am, solid as a rock, but because that was like, I was like, what? Um, so like on my way to like the hospital, I was like calling my boss as well as our like, someone called me to like check in and, and they could just tell by my voice on the phone that I was like on the brink of like a breakdown. And as soon as I saw the student and she was fine, she was totally okay. Um, but as soon as I saw that, like I, I was, I was fine. And so, so it was definitely like some of those things that like, that I tend to compartmentalize a lot. And so, um, so for, for my own personal stuff, I have to be a little bit more honest. I think that experience is, has told, like, has really informed like how I just maybe prepare, like I've, I've talked to here at USC and I've talked to our person who oversees like by both my boss and then also person who oversees um, some of those kind of emergency or would probably be the first person to get a call. And I, and I just let them know like, okay, hey, if you're calling me about one of my international students, like, because I see my international students as like my responsibility, my like, their parents are thousands of miles away. I am like their kind of like, mama bear, if you will, like, you know, like, I'm that first person that's, like, um, that's gonna have to work in that, and so I've, I've let them know, like, hey, if you have to call me about one of my international students who's been hurt, or in trouble, or whatever the case may be, you know, just know that I have had this experience, so if it, if it's anything else, it's fine, but if it's a, <clears throat> if it's a car accident or something, then I'm, like, just know I'm gonna need someone else, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna need someone else there for it to just make sure that like, um, so yeah, cause like that was a thing. Like when I showed up at the hospital, like my boss and a couple others showed up right after because they knew my experience with that. And they just knew that like, I needed that support. Um, and so when you're a one person office, some might not know some of those past experiences. So you have to be a little bit willing to, to make sure you're caring for yourself um, in some of those situations. If you know that like, you may or may not be able to be as supportive or you know supportive of an advocate or you might need to take some time for yourself following an incident like that um i feel like that got down a rabbit hole maybe a little bit but uh but for, for preparing the students i mean it's not really something that you can totally prepare for i i mean i think that because some of that is like, it's not like we GPS track our students, right? So it's like some of that is even going to be, um, you know, even an, a burden of other friends of theirs to notify or to let them know or just show that they have a concern. So when I approach a lot of like the health and safety with, um, with international students or with study abroad students, I talk a lot about, um, especially like group travel, those sorts of things about like caring for others on the program, like being a good, um, you know, like the whole buddy system, all those sorts of things, like just understanding that. Um, and I'm, and sometimes I think I get a little scary with students. I sometimes think I get maybe a little bit um, where I feel like they're, they're all going to not study abroad anymore because I scared them so much during pre-departure orientation where I'm just like, Campus Place is not picking you up. If you're in jail abroad, you're in jail abroad, okay? Like nobody's coming to, to like bail you out at like the next couple of hours. Like it's just, um, so it's some of those kind of, I think what I would say reality check conversations with students is just, 
it's just remembering that you are an international student or you are a study abroad student and that this isn't a familiar place to you this you know you need to make sure you know who your support system is and and then you know how can you um how can you just kind of best prepare them so mm -hmm. i mean being a one person office like my international students have my cell phone number like they they call me if they're like they they call me if there's an emergency and i have to sometimes be a little bit strict with them on that because i'll have a lot of them who will who might call me but they i don't i don't typically answer numbers i don't recognize and so i usually have to be really explicit with them like if you call me and you need me to call you back you have to leave a message because otherwise i'm not calling you back because that otherwise it's not an emergency right like it's you know you just or or i just have to make sure i'm like some some of them will cross boundaries and, and text me about something that could wait till like monday or you know those sorts of things so i think it's just a lot of times that front line setting expectations even some follow-up after the fact of like okay do you know who to you know who to contact do you have a plan um if you you know if you lose cell service or something like you know what what are the next steps make sure you have some of that because i can't give that to them for every single country in the entire world where they're traveling you have to do kind of like a really broad health and safety um but for my international students being at a small school they have my number mm. that, you know that makes it interesting you know, you know what we've chatted about the last five minutes, but one, one of the things that I'm interested in is, is looking at that um, mental health for study abroad practitioners and professionals and those types of things. Um, it's uh, something that um, I did a webinar um, with Terry Gibbons yesterday, I think it was, and uh, Justin Belton from Go Culture, and we were talking about the, the uh, situation as it stands at the moment in study abroad, um, how we're prepared for it and that type of thing. And uh, we have this situation now en masse, that, you know, that every year there's uh, people that have to pull out late and there's, you know, dashed dreams, you know, 0.5 of a percent or whatever it is wow. of those that are going. Now the entire study abroad population for, the, for this six months or nine months of this year at least um, are are uh, in a bad place mentally, um, and they have this grief that they need to work through, and you know this that then it can manifest in rage, it can manifest in many different ways, and uh, also study where professionals have to try and facilitate um, some form of um, you know uh, interaction with them to enable them to work through what they're feeling and those types of things. But we're not necessarily trained to be, you know, counselors and those types of things. And so I think I often think as you know, study abroad professionals are really have many hats to wear, not alone, you know, inbound, outbound, but just in that, as you say, you're mama bear, um, you're, you know, the study abroad police, you're you're drawing a line in the sand for them, you know, this is not okay. And um, preparing in a in an interculturally sensitive way, preparing in a, in a let's scare the what out of them to ensure that they, they that they know this is serious and unfortunately we, I, I understand that we do the same thing at times when we have uh, groups that come in and and you know you'll have the conversations in the background between the faculty and the study abroad and we'll be like these guys are a little bit out there you know we're going to have to draw a line in the sand fairly early on to make sure we don't lose them and they all go crazy and yeah. so you know we'll work as a team on that and and we'll really kind of have to kind of nail that that home and i i felt exactly the same thing as you've said where you feel a little bit guilty um uh, because you know it's the students in the faces and they're shocked and what have you um but unfortunately that's what it takes nowadays yeah. is that if you don't it'll go in one ear and out the other of 50 percent of the group and that's not good enough so so that's where we're at but um yeah so this mental health piece in in uh um for for study abroad professionals is um is an area that you know outside of what you know you've spoken about at the moment um is that something that you are cognizant of or have training in are looking for training in those types of things yeah actually um so i've had uh various different 
experiences, both positive and negative. And so, of course, like death of a couple of students, like that's a really intense thing. And I think right now in this current environment in the last couple of months, like study abroad professionals have been taking a lot of hits. Like they are having to take a lot of that emotional burden on themselves and maybe, and then turning around, maybe not knowing how to help in with themselves. And so I've actually done some, um, I've done some, uh, I've done, I did a session for the South Carolina Association of International Educators um, on just kind of self-care and mental health and in, in international education a couple of years ago. Um, also dealt a little bit with toxic environments because even if we're not in a, in a crisis, I feel like um, study abroad and international education professionals can tend to take a lot of hits at their, at their institution. Sometimes it's it might just be a faculty member who has just a really pushy personality or or has is a level of maybe arrogance about that you're there to serve them in if, yeah if i can be so intense but um but yeah so i think that's you know even our day-to-day -day lives like we're just having to take maybe some of that um that burden on ourselves and we're having to really develop a thick skin in order to to just you know deal with some of those, um, some of those uh, aspects of just higher education in general, right? And so I don't have necessarily formal training. Um, it is an area of interest for me. And so I, I am a very big believer in, you know, self, you know, self-care and mental, and mental health and, and understanding where are your limitations, where, where are your boundaries, what might even be some of your triggers. And so um, a lot of, I do a lot, even before I really got into this field, just as a person, I'm very self-reflective. And so I will usually, um, do a lot of that kind of self-reflection and, and just seeing like, okay, if something comes up and it's, and I didn't even like, there's been some triggers in my life recently that I didn't even realize were triggers. And so it would just be like, I'd read an email and suddenly I'm sobbing and i'm just like what is good or i'm just like so angry and i don't don't know why so a lot of time it's like okay first like figuring out how can i help myself in moving past those emotions for the time being to be able to reflect on them later um and some of that is uh you know i might just have a good cry who knows but i also could like um it also might just be other things that i need to just help get myself back into a better space and that might be reaching out to a friend that might be um you know finding a really good book that i read to enjoy it might even be watching a favorite disney movie whatever really kind of just helps you kind of get back into a better head space um so i don't have any of like the necessarily like the professional like training to do it but um but it is something that I'm always like advocating for, even if it's for my students or for others, like I am okay with having some of those hard conversations um, with not just myself, but also with friends or colleagues that I might see who are struggling. And so I try to be that for my colleagues in the field. I try to be almost kind of that safe space for, for them to come and maybe even if they just need to vent about something, you know, like that, um, or just bounce ideas off of, or just get that out, out in, you know, the air so that they can move on. If I tell, like, so like many in the field, I've gotten emails or calls from parents that have been angry and ragey. And depending on the situation, I try not to respond in, a, in, a, in an extreme emotional state, I guess you could say. So if like a parent has sent me a very intense, angry email, I will typically not just like go back to my computer and fire off like a really intense email. I will take a day. I will, I will take 24 hours and I will respond. And then even if I craft an email response back to them, I will let it sit in a draft for a couple of, um, you know, maybe an hour, maybe two, go back and reread it. Um, so that I'm not responding in, in a way that like, this is why I don't read the comments online. This is why I don't respond to comments online. Um, mostly just because like, I don't want to respond in a way that's not um, either professional or even just can be interpreted as in the moment and, and you know, 
could yeah, possibly I, create further aggression or issues or anything like that. But I know that it's hard to do sometimes because like we have to respond very quickly. Um, and so, you know, if I have something where it's come up immediately and I do need to respond to it immediately, I might take five minutes to just go outside, take in the sunshine, breathe the fresh air, and then be able to come back to that. Um, it, I'm, I have colleagues in, here on campus or friends here on campus that are my same safe space. So I might call to them and just rant. And then as soon as I like rant and get it out, then I'm, I'm okay. Um, I think another thing is like we forget kind of sometimes about all the good that we have done, you know, like all of the, the impact that we have had on students. So one of the suggestions when I did that session um, for a conference, I actually was um, paired with another uh, higher education student affairs professional, but he actually was working as a counselor a therapist previously. And one of the things that was pretty impactful from that for me was his we all get thank you cards. We all get those kind of like quick notes from either students or parents or um, or colleagues that, you know, that are just showing that kind of impact and it's that physical. So that was like his suggestion is like if you're really in a, in a headspace where you need that reminder, then take that stuff out of your drawer or your email box or or, you know, go back and find a good memory. Um, on the Facebook page or something like that to just remind yourself of the, the impact that you have and the, the good that you're doing. And you know, that, that, you know, that that's today is, is just one day, right? Like it's just, yeah. <laughs> it's so easy to get uh, caught up in the intensity of, of what's happening right now and yeah. forget that, you know, in five minutes, a week, two weeks, this, whatever it is will be gone and it will be in, in the past and it might be an unpleasant situation, but uh, it is uh, just a, a small big part in the grander scheme of things. And that's something I've been trying to work on as well. We have four minutes left and we haven't talked about COVID-19. Can you believe it? So let us talk for two to three minutes about what is new normal, what's COVID-19 mean to you personally, professionally? Um, what are you doing? Are you innovating? Is there anything that, you, that is, is changing processes for you? Um, what are you planning for the future? Sure. Um, I think like right now I have been in my own office and in my own space. It's kind of settled down for me from like the student side that I need to be like working with them and advocating with them. And I'm able to shift my focus on to some of those long-term projects that I've been like putting off, putting off, putting off because of the day to day. So that's really, I'm focusing on some of that. Um, I'm also looking at continuity of operations plans. You know, like I was on a NASA collegiate conversation um, uh, thing yesterday and that was actually kind of really cool to see, but they provided some really good resources <clears throat> that I can use as a one person office as a foundation to like build from um, because like, I'm in my office, like I, uh, for various reasons, but I've, I've realized that like, okay, if I'm like really told you have to lock down in your house, but you still have to like keep, keep up with work. Like I've done that a little bit, but not to the extent that I can't come back and have access to a printer or, you know, so, so focusing on some of those big long-term goals, um, new normal, I mean, there are some people in this conversation who kind of asked that yesterday and it was really fascinating. And I think this is definitely something that like we need to continue to have conversations about because no one's really sure what that's going to look like yet. Because as you said, everything's changing every day. Um, like, you know, when there's no, I can't answer the question of like when my students will be able to travel abroad again, you know, or they'll, there might be additional restrictions or something like, are they going to have to show an antibody test? Are they going to have to like, have the if we have a vaccine are they gonna have to have a vaccine or is just everything um you know locked down for until the vaccine is there so those are some considerations so i think how can we continue to stay i hate to use the phrase relevant i guess in in our in our universities and um and still provide a lot of that uh intercultural content and global experiences from a virtual perspective. And I've seen a lot of providers who are, who are really coming out with some very interesting content, um, like virtual study abroads and virtual internships. Um, 
I think that, you know, getting students to really consider those options, I think we're going to have to, um, I think we're going to have to do some work on like, how can we make these appealing for students on investing or, or taking the time. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of conversations and a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of, I, I'm so excited to see what some what people who are way smarter than me maybe come up with because I'm like, it could be something really super fascinating, but um, I don't know that we're ever necessarily going to get to a point where there, there's normal, you know, like we're just back to normal operations. I think those virtual options are probably going to continue. And I think that could even be a new study abroad, you know, like I think there are going to be students who are always looking for those things that they can do and not have to take the risk of traveling to another country or that their parents might even say no. And so maybe that's still a way that they can engage. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I think it's some kind of a hybrid piece where it's yeah. the virtual is here. Um, this is the catalyst in which will uh, bring many more minds thinking, you know, how do we innovate within the virtual space um, for the short term? And then there's the medium to long term after that. And it will stay in whatever shape or form it is, or it will be tweaked uh, to become a composite part of what a study abroad is in the greater grand scheme of things. Um, and again, what that looks like, we don't know. But uh, before we go, just one last thing. And um, when, when we were chatting before we started, um, you were saying that you, you know, people keep asking me and they're saying that they're fine. And you, you had an acronym for that and I thought it was great. So well, tell us, well, you know, everybody out there, when you're, when you're feeling, you know, when you answer the question, you say, I'm fine, but you're not really that fine. This is what it means. Go for this. So from the Italian job movie uh, is freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope that it's just a joke at this stage uh, but it's been really interesting Sunday chatting to you <laughs> yeah well you know we've talked through so many different things so many really important parts and some components of, of the thing we've talked about the of students we've talked about the, the differing offices in private and public universities for the larger offices single person offices um you know process issues we've talked about um, dealing with emergency situations, you know, your own mental health situation when you're, uh, uh, you know, knowing to be self-aware. And I really loved when you were talking about you have such self-awareness that, you know, if I, you can see ahead that if there is a possibility in a situation, you know, um, with the death of a student or, or a serious accident may set you off and you have the foresight to be able to say, hey guys, if this happens, you, I'm telling you now, we have a plan that you're going to come around because I'm going to need that. I think that's real leadership. Uh, when you know your weaknesses and you plan for them, I think that's brilliant. So I think um, we will leave it at that, but I just want to say thanks so much, um, Liz uh, Dilly uh, from the University of South Carolina, Aiken. Um, I really appreciate your time and um, I'm wishing you all the best and hopefully we will, we will see what new normal is sooner rather than later. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate you having to be a part of this. It's been a pleasure. And for the folks that have been listening, thanks so much for sticking with us again. Um, I think that you're starting to get some uh, sense of, you know, kind of these tangents that we go on. And, you know, the remit of these things is to speak about COVID and how it goes. Um, but there is so much more to speak about um, on, a, on a person by person basis and uh, on any given day. So I hope that you're getting some value from this. This has been a Coffee with Cloud podcast with myself, uh, Chris Lawler, CEO and co-founder of Learn International. And um, please tune in again next week um, when we're talking to somebody else, someplace else in the world who's involved in some form of international mobility. All the best, folks. Bye now.